day, this added to our firepower like no other weapon could have. Once you got used to it and you fell in love with the weapon, you then rarely carried anything else. In 1962, Eugene M. Stoner, developer of the AR-15 M16 assault rifle, began work on a new weapons concept. He envisioned a new design to give a fighting man more firepower in a lightweight, versatile, compact package. A Cadillac Gage Company engineering team headed by Stoner spent the next year designing a revolutionary weapon system that would become known as the Stoner 63. The heart of the Stoner 63 was the multi-use receiver, which could be configured into six different weapons. Two rifle variations were possible, a folding stock carbine and an assault rifle. Three of the four machine gun versions were belt-fed. The light machine gun, a tripod-mounted medium machine gun, and a solenoid-operated fixed machine gun for aircraft or vehicular use. The fourth variation was magazine-fed from the top. The carbine and assault rifle models were select fire and operated from a closed bolt position. These air-cooled gas-operated weapons fed 5.56 millimeter ammunition from a staggered 30-round curved magazine. This was a 50% improvement over the M16. Removing four internal parts and inverting the rifle receiver configured the Stoner 63 for firing fully automatic from an open bolt. This conversion disabled the select fire option and the weapon could be set up for a top magazine feed similar to the British Bren gun. Offset sights were designed so the operator could see past the vertical magazine. This option gave the gunner a lower profile while engaging targets from fixed positions. As a belt-fed, solenoid-operated weapon, the Stoner 63 could be mounted in a vehicle or aircraft. An aerodynamically designed pod was available which carried three of the solenoid-operated Stoners. The lightweight 5.56 mm high-velocity rounds were easily deflected and made aircraft mounting of the Stoner impractical. The gun saw little use in this configuration. Mounting the stoner in a special adapter cradle for the M2-M122 tripod configured the weapon for its role as a medium machine gun. Removing the cradle and tripod converted the stoner to a light machine gun. By 1966, stoner production had moved from Costa Mesa, California to Warren, Michigan. Approximately 2,400 weapons had been manufactured. Testing had been conducted by the U.S. Army and Marine Corps to determine the stoner's suitability as a replacement for the M16 rifle. This testing led to refinements in the original stoner design, resulting in the upgraded stoner 63A. Although none of Stoner's configurations won favor with the larger military establishment in the light machine gun mode, this innovative weapon system achieved legendary status in the hands of the Navy SEALs. The U.S. Navy had classified the Stoner 63A light machine gun as the Mark 23 Mod O for its SEAL teams in Vietnam by 1967. These elite warriors took advantage of the massive firepower the stoner offered in a light weapon. As unconventional warfare experts, SEALs combat tested every possible configuration of the stoner 63A light machine gun. Retired SEAL veteran Lieutenant Commander Michael J. Walsh remembers his introduction to the stoner. My first experience with the stoner was in 1968. Um, in those days, we had uh, UDT training, and the SEAL course was separate. 
So you went through 18 weeks of UDT training carrying an M1 Garand, and then when you got orders to a SEAL team, you started your six-week SEAL basic indoctrination, and then you actually saw you, most of your first weapons. Serious weapons training began then. In those days, when you first saw the stoner, it was like nothing else around. It was different. It didn't look like anything else. And if you had any weapon savvy at all, you knew that right away, that this was an awesome weapon. And usually the first thing you, you saw was on the desert firing range, you got a firepower demo, uh, which was very impressive. This is the Stoner 63 Alpha light machine gun, 5.56 millimeter, linked. And this is the primary machine gun that the SEAL platoons used during the Vietnam War. Um, it's gas operated, air cooled. Um, it had three firing speeds adjusted with this gas port from 750, 900, and 1,000 rounds a minute. Uh, new developments during the Vietnam War was this flash suppressor, and the, the gentleman that invented this was Eugene Stoner, who also was the man that invented the M16 rifle. Brand new technology for its day. Uh, headspace and timing, a preset, which was uh, right along with the M60 machine gun, a very desirable feature. This, the cocking lever was underneath the weapon. Just bring her back like that, bring her forward, which also allowed you to take the barrel out, and you could see the grooves these are the cooling grooves of the weapon, which actually gives the weapon more surface area, allowing it to cool faster. Just pop it right back in. Make sure she's locked. And you were basically, at this point, when she was loaded, ready to fire. Uh, safety is right behind the trigger guard. This is the ammunition box. The, uh, they came packed with 100 rounds of 5.56 linked in there. And had the same basic cover, very similar in many respects to the M60 light machine gun. The slings were up, up on, placed on top of the weapon so that you could just rest the weapon slung over your shoulder to read a map or get a drink of water. Uh, and that was as individual as, as the people. Uh, use of the... Uh, the front sling actually obscured your vision, but we learned at this point to fire instinctively with the weapon. So you, you never really use the front sight, um, unless some, some guys would bend this down on the right side so that the, the sling came down here um, using front sight focus method, which it, the rear sight became useless. Um, but a very accurate weapon delivered a lot of fire in a very short amount of time. The stoner handled really smoothly. Uh, at that point, it was the smoothest weapon I had fired fully automatic. Uh, very little recoil. You just lean into it. You, uh, let the, uh, let the handguard rest in your left hand, and it was a very smooth weapon. Uh, low flash at night. All the right stuff. The platoon structure was such that uh, there were 14 man seal platoons. Uh, two seven-man squads. Each squad had an officer. And the, uh, in your standard basic army infantry setup, point man, radio man, patrol leader, automatic weaponsman, rear security. And uh, there was usually only one corpsman per platoon. The, um, my particular squad on that first trip with, the, uh, with SEAL Team 1, we had three stoners, two M60s, uh, I carried the AK, and the radioman carried the uh, the Car 15.
that's a significant amount of firepower. The, the particular platoon that I, I recall, we had six of these, three in each squad, which basically it gave a SEAL platoon the same firepower as an infantry company. Uh, in an instance of that is three stoners and two M60 machine guns per seven-man squad. Small SEAL units working deep in enemy territory made efficient use of the increased firepower that the stoner could deliver. Mission briefings included expected enemy positions, terrain, and other intelligence information. The patrol leader would also assign ammunition and ordnance loads for each SEAL team member. Okay, you guys, knock off back there. Let's get started. On this box, we're going to do some grave digging. Charlie has some weapons stashed in the graveyard about three clicks above the Finlook Bridge. It's a small cache, but we need to refine our intelligence picture for that part of the province. We got this 15-year-old BC that came to the Chew Hawaii Center the other day with the sun blown off. It seemed that he and his buddy got hit by a fuel based ice strike and his buddy got killed. He knew this area, so he was scared, lonely, injured, and then he sped up the whole mess. There's been a few leaf of drops in the area, and the MSC people passed out some psyops material up there recently, too. Anyway, he picked the leaf up someplace and came on in. At the Chu Hoy Center, he wasn't informed about the cash value of weapons, but he could still find it. He said he could and agreed to leave him for more weapons. The cash in a graveyard contains an AK-47, about 10 B-40 rockets, an AK and cluster bombs, some blasting caps, documents, and stuff like that. The area is heavily mined, so we're going in during the daylight. The kid thinks he knows the way to the mine fields and booby traps. I want that insertion to be extremely slow. There's trip bars all along that riverbank. This whole office close to the river so we get all the firepower in the world right behind us on the boat. We'll spend most of your time watching where you step. We won't be setting up a perimeter this time. There's too many mines. I want the Hoy John first, then Sam and the other LDN in, then the rest of us in the in formation. I can't stress caution too much. There's going to be trip wires and springs of hand grenades. And we can expect lots of cluster bombs like the ones on the last cache you went into. Did everybody get a chance to see those? Yeah. Just because this is our first day off in a while, don't get lax and start enjoying the scenery. We don't want to come out of there with a bunch of casualties. As for weapons and ordnance, you guys the sonars take 450 rounds. Whistler, you better take the M60 in about 450. Since you got the radio, you can take the M16 to about 200 rounds. Johnny, you take the M79 to about 34 rounds. I'll take the 762 sniper, and somebody better bring a shovel. As for our communications, the freaks are posted. Seals will be trade wind, MST will be ramrod and Malibu. Lieutenant Coyter will coordinate the off from the LCPL. He has a vote of 1300. Each SEAL improvised his own method for carrying the large number of rounds the clandestine operations required. Some men improvised with standard issue combat gear. What worked really well was uh, canteen pouches, empty canteen pouches. The, the regular M16 battle pouch, that, that had a tendency to shrink a little bit as time went on because it was wet, dry, wet, dry, and it shrank a lot. But the regular U.S. canteen pouch worked great. You just snapped it. When you needed ammo, you just pulled out a 100-round belt. You could have those 200 rounds ready to go right away. Some people wore it under their cami shirt, so you had rounds there and you didn't glow in the dark. Um, it, it, the average load was about 500 rounds per man. In the continuing quest for more firepower, SEALs sought to increase the capacity of stoner magazines. Early efforts included this adaptation of an enemy RPD drum. Later field modifications led to a higher capacity plastic box. We also found that we needed more than the original uh, 100 rounds. So some of these boxes were actually cut right at this end, and another half again length of box was applied to it. It came to about here which gave us uh, roughly 180 rounds. You had latitude to try new things. If something didn't work, you tried something else.
One operator stacked two of the black plastic boxes to carry nearly 200 rounds of the 5.56 mm high-velocity ammunition. This particular seal carried extra rounds in an AK-47 chest pouch. Others preferred the metal drums that Cadillac Gage introduced during the war. These cylindrical magazines were designed to hold 150 rounds of linked ammunition. I did see a wire stock on this, the, the wire type stock, but this was the predominant stock, uh, particularly on, on the West Coast group. And the East Coast guys did have a wire stock. Occasionally I saw that once or twice. I don't recall ever seeing that any more than that. But, uh, and once I saw somebody without, without the stock, the weapon is way out of balance. You need the stock to fire it from the shoulder. Um, bad habit to get into, in my opinion, of operating without a stock. You have a tendency to fire very wildly, and an ammo, when you only have 500 rounds, you, you have to husband that resource, use it when you need it. See, it just, without the stock, you're throwing the balance of the weapon off. Weight. See, you, uh, the one, one is the weight, but... Um, Having having the wire stock is weight, but when you have a weapon of like this, it's not like a submachine gun. This is a light machine gun. You need the stock there for balance. And that's what's going into your shoulder. You're going to lean into that. And if you don't have that to lean into, see, it's like trying to fire it this way. It's just more difficult. It's, you want to be able to bring it up and engage. Cooperation between Cadillac Gage and the Navy SEALs began early in the field use of the Stoner 63A. SEALs found Cadillac Gage engineers very receptive to new ideas. The Warren, Michigan factory received performance reports directly from SEALs in Vietnam. You could see two or three major changes in this weapon within a year. The factory was real responsive. Cadillac Gage quickly implemented a modification following a tragic accident during a SEAL mission. This is the, uh, the now infamous dead man pin, which was developed after an accident, where this pin had a tendency to drift out. It vibrated out in the it, when the weapon was first introduced. The, uh, the guy carrying it was killed because he was sitting in a boat with the muzzle right here into his chest. And this, and this pin, which became the dead man pin, had drifted out, which caused the weapon to separate right here the receiver group separated right here, which there was nothing to hold the sear. And he, he put considerable bullets into himself and he died. So this, this was the first major modification that I remember. They, they put a double screw in here and it was like a little detent and it locked. It never happened again. Although the stoner's advanced features endeared it to many seals, the weapon had its problems. Drum-fed weapons would occasionally jam from spin back when ejected casings re-entered the chamber. A pair of small parts in the feed mechanism were a common cause of difficulties in early belt-fed stoners. The feed pole, that was the one part that consistently broke. And you had to, and if there was no time to replace it, you brought home a 13-pound club. So it was maintenance intensive, which was an undesirable feature of it. You had to baby it. You had to get the carbon out of this area, back out of the, uh, the bolt group in, here in the, in the receiver end. The ammo came in 100 round belts. The boxes came packed like they are. Uh, it was not uncommon to see bandoliers crisscrossed across people with not only the stoner, but the M60 as well. The feed tray similar, the latch cover similar to an M60 in a great many respects. 
this was the 100 round ammo box. It came in 556 five, linked uh, ammunition, which we'll put into the weapon. Uh, you loaded this before you went anywhere. When you were ready to go, you simply put your protective cover back on, your belt protector, put the safety on, the weapon is ready to fire. I saw Stoner's trips two, three, and four. The first trip, I wasn't in the teams yet. I, I was riding swift boats based out of Cameron Bay. Uh, the, the trips with the Phoenix program and the SEAL platoon trips, yes. The last trip was an intelligence trip. Didn't see any Stoner's there. Uh, but when I, operating in the SEAL mode, yes. In the pure SEAL platoon or Phoenix advisory role mode, yes. He's, stoners were a daily part of life. One of the unsung uses of the stoner was in supporting the SEAL advisors who were in the Phoenix program, which is where SEAL and Phoenix support really shined. Because that SEAL PRU advisor could always get support from the platoon. You put any number of stoners and or M60s online, the provincial reconnaissance unit would just drive these people in an L-shaped ambush right into you. And that was devastatingly effective under the right conditions. Good operation planning, good OPSEC, it worked. And that's where, outside of normal SEAL use, the stoner really shined. And it actually became the norm for SEAL platoons to support the Phoenix program. And it one, one helped the other. And then as these individual SEALs came out of the Phoenix program and went back into platoons, our whole intelligence collection effort and smartness just grew by leaps and bounds. It's like each platoon got smarter with each trip. I, that kind of learning curve has never been repeated. We've never learned as much as fast. One platoon briefed another. The information transfer was enormous. And sometimes there wasn't enough time to write it all down. So the, the intelligence department, as time went on, began to try to document some of this. Intelligence and operations began to try to click a little bit together. And it depended on who was in the operations office. A good ops boss got good notes from the platoon commanders. The CO debriefed the platoon. The officers were debriefed with the platoon and then again separately. Um, I. I became a believer in the debrief method early on, very early in my career, and in the value of gathering your own intelligence. The, the platoons could gather intelligence, process intelligence, and then react on that same information. And this is where the Naval Intelligence Liaison Officers, known as NILOs, they're another unsung group of people that deserve a lot of credit. Uh, those officers coordinated the platoon intelligence collection effort. Uh, very smart people. The Navy did a good job in picking those folks. They, they're they directly responsible for the value of our intelligence. So between the NILO and the, and the Phoenix advisor, if he was a SEAL, that was the perfect triangle. And we all worked together. We verified intelligence. The NILO could give, us to, give it to us and we could react to it that night. Beautiful. Beautiful way to do business. And you have to remember, You'll, you'll hear a lot of critiques here and there. There was no rule book. SEAL Team was still just six or eight years old. The rule book was still being written. And with each platoon that came back, added a volume to that, which got us to where we are today. Uh, but those, every one of those lessons, sadly, most of them were written in blood.
normal jungle patrol, you could cross 12 or 13 streams a night, easy. Um, so if you saw a monkey bridge, you went across it. But one way or another, you would cross 12 or 13 streams, and it was nothing to go down 12 feet of river bank, cross a river at low tide, go up another 12 or 13 foot vertical mud wall. So the, the advantage of the point man was that he was the first one up. And then basically from that point on, you pulled everyone else up the wall. You get asked about balance, and balance was important, uh, particularly in the jungle environment. The longer barrel gave some guys better balance. Some men had, had preferred the longer barrel, even with the, the encumbrance of that length in the jungle. Um, this became very popular, the shorter version. And, and balance is important because you, you, when you're crossing a monkey bridge, you, you're, you're going across the monkey bridge fairly fast, and you want your load balanced, and you're, you're tiptoeing across a bamboo pole about like this at night. And the first guy across is the lucky guy, because everybody else tracks their mud across it. The real, the real art form is for the, the M60 man who's rear security to get across that bridge without falling off. Because, you know, noise compromises you. So you're, you're tiptoeing across, balancing your weapon. So it was a question of, uh, you know, just necessity. And we, and we trained a lot uh, in various swamps in Southern California, uh, the salt and sea being one that comes right to mind. Uh, we, we erected monkey bridges and just had people run across it with their equipment. That's the only way to train. Most SEAL operations in Vietnam didn't go past one evolution of darkness. And most of the time, you never carried food. All you carried was a little water, and you'd go, and you didn't eat till you got home. So and operations would run about a 24-hour cycle. You'd go out at night, come back sometime the next day. Um, even on daytime patrols, rarely did people carry rations. I mean, sometimes they did. But mostly it was just water to get you through that. The classic example of the one-handed stoner shot is um, a SEAL squad inserting on a forward command post uh, deep in hostile country, uh, a single gunship mission, seven SEALs, and an interpreter. And as the helicopter is landing, we're flying nape of the earth, and the helicopter is coming into the target right in front of the command post. You're just hearing this whop, whop, whop. We're at this angle relative to the ground, and the point man picks that stoner up and engages an enemy soldier while he's running, blew his brains. Uh, we're not even on the ground yet. Landed on the ground. This guy comes out of the helicopter, tumbles, rolls, is on his feet, and uh, the weapon worked amazingly well. Uh, that's a rare example but this this guy was an extremely good shot with this weapon uh, and that's that's the only time I'd ever seen anything like that of course we were engaged right away the other squad got pinned down by another en enemy squad um, so it got real intense there for a few minutes but that this thing performed really really well um, if you were inside a hooch and come out and you would get engaged by conventional forces dug in you could suppress some fire this bought you time, if, if you were wise, until the gunships got overhead. If I were to sum up the stoner's role vis-a-vis -vis Navy SEALs in Vietnam, um, it wouldn't be any one thing. It, would, uh, it greatly increased our firepower. Again, if you had six stoners and four M60s in a 14-man in a SEAL platoon, You've got company-sized firepower uh, just with machine guns alone. You could lay down a tremendous base of firepower. You could protect the insertion craft on the way back. So if you, if you were fired on, not only was there one 50 caliber going back at them, you had that, that all the platoon's firepower instantly engaged, which is a significant base of firepower, and that got you home. The Navy SEAL's ability to carry out clandestine missions is now legendary. Their early history originated in the jungles and mangrove swamps of South Vietnam. 
SEAL Teams 1 and 2 waged war on the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese Army with such cunning and stealth that the phrase men with green faces struck terror in the enemy. An important factor in the success of the Navy's new elite fighting units was the tremendous firepower they could deliver. The devastating light machine gun version of the Stoner 63A played a crucial role in the creation of that legend.